you turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 1? I got a long title here. Uh, hopefully, we'll, you'll understand why. Uh, Comfort and Tribulation, uh, the Vision of the Glorious Christ. You know, as, um, as Tim was alluding earlier in his prayer time, you know, our, our nation has been under a lot of uh, struggles. And this week, just again, uh, just the pain and the trials. I, I can't imagine being a parent um, having to uh, deal with what some of the parents in Texas are dealing with um, today. Um, Father, uh, that's a wound that will probably be there for, for the rest of their lives. And uh, I don't want to get into a political debate, but you know there are going to be political debates. As, mo as soon as something like that happens, inevitably, people are going to debate what should happen. And, and the one thing that is never really talked about is what's happening in the heart of humanity. The brokenness that is happening in our hearts, that is coming out in our lives, that is the reason. You can put all the laws that you want, but laws don't stop lawbreakers. And lawbreakers break laws. Politicians are not going to solve this problem. Removing one and replacing it with another does not stop the troubles and the trials that we go through. And in fact, as we go through these troubles and trials, we're going to find that the persecution that we're going to endure is going to get stronger and bigger. And that there are brothers and sisters around this world that are suffering immense persecution for their faith. And I am telling you as a warning and also as a um, preparation that I think it's coming to us as well. And maybe for some of you, you're experiencing some level of persecution within your own family. Maybe you're experiencing persecution when it comes to your jobs, but eventually it is going to come to all of us. It has to. The gates of hell are going to try to knock against Christ's church over and over again. And the persecution that comes can lead us to great levels of despair and despondency. We could find ourselves fearful and overwhelmed. And, and John is writing to a group of people that are under great persecution right now. And he wants to bring them comfort, and he wants to bring conviction, and he also wants to bring them correction. And in essence, that's what this book of Revelation is about. Comfort from Christ the Savior, convicting us to not live like the world and correcting our lives so that we look more and more holy, more and more like the lights that we are supposed to be in the darkness that is here. As we heard last week, John is exiled on Patmos, an island, and John is suffering for his faith. All the rest of the apostles have died off, have been martyred, and John alone is here. And it's not that John's got an easy life. He has been banished to this island. And for most of us, when we find ourselves banished in certain ways, we find ourselves getting more depressed and we turn inward. That's not what John is doing. John is turning outward and he's using this opportunity to continue to speak gospel message, to continue to testify. And the reason why we have this book today is because John kept his vision focused on that Christ, the glorious Christ, in spite of the struggles that he's going through. That's wise counsel for us today. Look with me here in Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 and following. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit, of the, Lord, the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice was speaking to me and turning, I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands, one like the son of man clothed in a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. The hair of his head was white like wool like snow, his eyes were like flame of fire, his feet like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came the sharp two-edged sword, and his 
face was like the sun shining in full strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me. And he said, fear not. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. Right there for these things you have seen those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is God's sufficient, eternal, authoritative, life-giving, and life-changing word. Would you pray with me? Father, I, I so appreciate Carmelo and um, the music team. That last song just really got me, Father. Is he worthy? He is. So, Lord, I thank you for the fact that we have a God in you, the Ancient of Days. We have the Son of Man, truly God and truly man. We have the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit that lives in us and is giving us this revelation today. Thank you for the triune God, for you. Thank you for the fact that though we were rebels, you chose to bring us to you. Thank you for your son's life. Thank you for his death. Thank you for his resurrection. Thank you for his session in heaven. And thank you that he, as our high priest, is interceding for us even right now. So today, Father, in the midst of the struggles and the chaos and the confusion, comfort us with a gaze at your Son, the glorious Christ, today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I have four points this morning. Uh, the first point is uh, verse 9, the sufferer's companions and calling. The sufferer's companions and calling. Look with me in verse 9. What does it say? I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, who was called on the island of Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony. First, what we see is John is describing himself. He says, I, John. He is the last of the apostles, as we have already said. All the other apostles have been martyred for their faith. Some see the book of Revelation as an early onset. I don't know. And he would have been in his 70s. If you believe in a later um, re rendering of Revelation, he's probably in his 90s. That's probably where I hold here. So what do we see? Who is talked about here? He talks about John, and he is identifying himself. But I really appreciate the fact that he identifies himself as a brother and a partner. See that? He says he identifies himself as part of a brotherhood and a sisterhood. He doesn't put himself above us. He says he is alongside us. I really appreciate that. He's part of the family of God. And Christianity is really about, it's not a religion, it's about a relationship, a relationship with God because of Christ, the filling of the Holy Spirit, and a relationship of brothers and sisters in Christ. The unity that the world talks about will never happen outside of Christ because it's Christ who brings people together, different people, different backgrounds, nations, tongues. He brings us together in Christ. And what John is arguing here is this, I'm part of the family of God. We are believers together. He says also that in being a partner, he says, I'm a partner with you. And he talks about three ways that he's a partner. First, he says, I'm a partner with you in tribulation. In tribulation. This is so important for us as a Christian church to remind ourselves of this, that we live in a world full of troubles and trials, difficulties. The Christians that he is speaking to are suffering economically. They're suffering socially. They're suffering politically. And they may, some of them may lose their lives. And he's talking about these people that are going through these great troubles and trials and difficulties. And he's saying this, I'm part of 12 that are all gone. They've been murdered for their faith. I'm the last one standing. I know exactly what you're going through. I can understand the troubles and the trials that you're going through. And now what John is saying is this, that he's going through a tribulation because he's on this Isle of Patmos. And he's suffering because he won't stop preaching the gospel. And he won't stop testifying about the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps you and I may never 
face the troubles and trials that the people that he's writing to suffered. But I will tell you this, is this, that as long as we are Christian, as long as we are lights in the darkness, we are going to suffer some level of trials or persecutions or sufferings or troubles. You need to have the courage to hold fast to your faith just like John did and just like his receivers of his letter did as well. Well, John says, first, I'm a partner with you in a tribulation. Second, he says, I'm a partner with you in the kingdom. I really find this interesting because he is saying that, yes, you're going to go through troubles and trials and difficulties, but I want you to remind yourself of this. You are a kid's king. You're a kid of the king. You're a child of the king. There's a kingdom that is not only future, there's a kingdom that has come. Jesus Christ has come into the world. God's kingdom is here today, which is so important, so encouraging to know that in the midst of the tribulations, there is a kingdom that is here, and you need to keep both in balance. Our story is a story of victory. We are on the winning side. We have an everlasting kingdom that is here. Even death cannot separate you from the kingdom that God has granted you in the person and work of Christ. The gates of hell may go against us, but will never prevail against Christ's church. Let that be such an encouragement to you as you go through the trials and the troubles to know that you are king's kid. First, tribulation, a partner with you in tribulation. Second, a partner with you in the kingdom. Third, a partner with you in patient endurance. He says this, he calls us to suffer long, which is so important. I think far too often many Christians today have a very immature view of suffering. They've been hearing that, you know, as soon as you come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, everything is supposed to be great. Well, it's not. Everything in your life is great, but everything around you may not be. And the troubles and the trials that you're going through are going to be even more difficult as you go against the world and opposed to the world and different from the world. You need to know that, my brothers and sisters. And you need to be patient in endurance. This tribulation that you're going through is going to be this side of heaven. And this is going to happen because we are going to have to hold and balance the fact that we are suffering in this world, we're part of the kingdom, and we need to be patiently enduring until the kingdom ultimately comes. So John is saying that I'm partners with you. We're grounded in the fact that we're grounded and fixed in our faith. We're fixed in the fact that we have this immense belief and he says that we are suffering the tribulations and part of the kingdom and patient endurance because you are in Christ. I really love this. You know, Paul talked about this in Ephesians chapter 1. He said that in Christ, we have these immense spiritual blessings. We have these privileges for being blessed in the beloved. We are chosen. We're predestined. We are forgiven. We are adopted. We are redeemed. We have an inheritance. You have blessing after blessing. You've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. You have amazing blessings. Keep them in your vision when you go through the troubles and the trials. When you do that, remind yourself that in Christ you have great safety, great security. You are significant in his sight because he sent his son to die for you. You're valuable not because you're just valuable in and of yourself. You're valuable because God paid an infinite worth for you. Keep that in your mind. John says, I'm your brother and I'm your partner in tribulation and kingdom and patience. He says, because we're in Christ, but he tells you where he is. He tells you that he's on the Isle of Patmos. Pastor Tim talked about this last week. Patmos was about 35 miles southwest or west of the city of Miletus. And it was off the coast of Asia Minor. The Romans used it as like a a place to, like the Alcatraz of their time. What they would do is was a prison island. You would go there and you would be forced into hard labor. It wasn't just banishment, but it was hard labor. Apparently there was great marble that was there. And so what they did was they allowed, the, they made the prisoners force labor to go out and work in the quarries. Now, can you imagine a 70 plus or maybe 90 plus year old man banished alone away from his family and then he's in hard labor. And that is what John is. John is there in this desolate place. And he tells you why he was banished. He says, I was banished on account of the word of God and the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had been sent to the island and punished because he was declaring the word of God, declaring the gospel, and because he continued to share his faith without hesitation. 
I wonder about you and me, is would we find ourselves, if the law came down that we could not profess our faith any longer, would we find ourselves willing to be banished, but willing to be suffering, willing to be persecuted, willing to be martyred for our faith, John was? So first, we see that John is talking about the sufferer's companions and his calling. Second, we see the supreme voice and vision, verses 10 through 16, the larger portion here. The supreme voice and vision, watch what he says in verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Now he says first, I'm in the spirit. And I don't think this means, like Paul talked about it in Galatians, in the spirit or in the flesh. I don't think that's what he's talking about. I believe that the Holy Spirit has caught him up and revealed this amazing revelation. Whether he's been caught up out of the body or whatever it is, he is awake, he is alive, he is mindful of what is happening. And what John tells us is that not only is he caught up by the spirit, which seemed to happen with Paul, which seemed to happen with Peter, and similarly it's happening here with John. We see that in other passages of scripture. But now it's happening on the Lord's day. Now some who think about this as a future text would say the Lord's day when Christ comes back in the future. I don't think that's what he means. I believe he's talking about a Sunday. Just like you and I, all of us are sitting here in this service, worshiping God on a Sunday. We gather together. I love the church. I, it breaks my heart not to be able to be in the church. When we had that period of time when we couldn't be here and when we were sitting here preaching to an empty room, it broke my heart because I really wanted to be in communion with you. Can you imagine what it feels like if you were banished and you couldn't be there? And you look at the calendar and it's a Sunday morning and you know that believers are worshiping and you can't be there. And what Jesus Christ did for him was he came and gave him a vision and he came to him on the Lord's day on that Sunday. And he says, I'm here. And I want you to see the senses of what happens. We're going to see John is going to hear. He's going to see, he's going to feel, he's going to get touched. He doesn't say taste or smell, but I can almost hear taste and see that the Lord is good. All of his senses are going to happen now as he sees this supreme, hears the supreme voice and sees the supreme vision. This voice comes before, behind him. It's like a trumpet. It's loud. It grabs his attention. Whoa, it shocks him into action. It's a powerful voice. The trumpets were often a call in scripture for a call to battle, a call to arms, a call to wake up. It was a call that John is hearing. All of a sudden behind him, he is shocked into, this, into senses. His senses are impacted. He hears it. Now he's going to see. He's going to touch. He is going to sense the risen Christ. I want you to keep in mind that as he sees this vision, John was the disciple that Jesus loved. And the night that, he, that Christ was betrayed, it was John that laid his head on Christ's shoulder. He was so close to Christ that he could lay his head on his shoulder. I want you to see that vision of the human Christ, the God-man, and now the vision of the God-man that he is going to show. see here. Verse 11, write what I say in a book and send it to the seven churches. So he is now, he hears his call. Christ is telling him authoritatively, I want you to see what you're seeing, and I want you to write it down, and I want you to send it to the seven churches, which is so important. And he's going to give us the rest of this letter in doing that. So what is he supposed to write down? He's saying, write down what you see, and then he's supposed to send it to these seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Uh, they form kind of like a geographic order, and apparently they were like in a uh, horseshoe. So you would start in Ephesus, you would end in Laodicea, and if you were a postal carrier, you would take a letter from there and you would go to each one of those sites. So in essence, as Paul is writing, as, as John is writing, he is writing to each one of these sections. And then Jesus what happens is this, we see that John turns. Now he's heard the voice and it's come behind him. And now he turns to see the voice. He, he turns to see the person that is speaking and that which was speaking to me. And I turn and what he sees, the first thing he sees is seven golden lampstands. 
Seven is the idea of completeness. Now, there are seven churches that are here, but in the scriptures, seven means completeness. And in essence, it's not just these seven churches. He's saying the whole church. I want you to see the whole church in vision here. But these seven golden lampstands, they are valuable lampstands. Gold is of great value, great worth, but they're lampstands. And lampstands are this, this mechanism where it is you put a lamp on top of it and then it shines light. You don't put a light down on the floor because it's not going to shine light. You want to put it up as high as you possibly can. And that's what these lampstands were. So you would put the lamp on top of this lampstand and it would shine light in the darkness. And what we see is we see one standing in the midst, verse 13, of the lampstands. And in the midst is one like the Son of Man. So he looks and he turns and he sees these seven lampstands. And then he sees Christ. And he sees one like the Son of Man. And this goes back to uh, back into Daniel. And as you read Daniel, Daniel um, would be really important to read as, you, as we continue. And let me just flip there for a moment in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. It says this in verse 13, I saw, Daniel 7, verse 13, I saw the night vision and behold the clouds of heaven and there came one like a son of man and he came to the ancient of days. So we see one who seems to be the son of man, the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to see here in Revelation and one who's coming to the ancient of days, which is God the father. And he, he was presented before him and to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom to all people and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. Daniel sees this vision hundreds of years before Christ. And John is writing about the fact that that vision you saw, Daniel, that vision is the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ. So when he turns in Revelation, he sees one like the Son of Man. And I want you to see what he sees. He sees his clothing first. He says he's clothed in a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. Now, the long robe could be a sign of kings. Kings would wear long robes. Prophets in the Old Testament would wear long robes. But the high priest would wear a long robe and the golden sash. And what, what John is envisioning here is one, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, standing there like a prophet, like a priest, like a king, but he's the true high priest. And what does a high priest do? The high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and sacrifice so that we would be purified. What Jesus Christ did was he went to the Holy of Holies for you and sacrificed himself so that you could be purified in God's sight. But the other thing that the high priest would do is that they would trim the wicks of the light so that there would be greater light out there. And, and in essence, what Jesus is saying is this. I not only have set you fee, free by forgiving you, I've not only set you free from sin, but I am doing something in your life so that you can shine more light, more light into a dark world. So John hears this voice, he sees this lampstand, he sees the one like the Son of Man, he sees the golden sash, and then in verse 14, the hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. What does he see? He sees the purity of Christ, the holiness of Christ, the eternality of Christ. Christ is from beginning and end. He has never had a beginning. He is never going to have an end. And he is absolutely pure. And when he sees this vision, he sees this vision of an eternal one. He sees this vision of a perfect one, a holy one, innocent, undefiled, separated, pure, no sin. He's the holy one of Israel. He's the holy one of God. You remember as we were going through the gospel of Mark, how many times the demon would say, you're the holy one of God. Even the demons could see the holiness of Christ. Well, John sees this. He gets a vision of this holy God, this infinite God, this eternal God. But he doesn't stop there. He sees his eyes. He says his eyes were like flames of fire. His eyes were piercing eyes. His eyes could see through you. His eyes could see everything about you. You may be able to 
uh, thwart somebody else's vision of you. You may be able to get people to believe things about you that are absolutely not true, but the reality is this. God sees you. God sees every thought that you've ever had. He sees every attitude. He, says, he sees every action. He sees it all. It's a piercing gaze. For those that are outside of Christ, that can be really fearful. And even for us in Christ, I mean, I don't really want Christ to be able to see some of the things that are in my heart at times. But this thought, it reminded me of back in Psalm chapter, Psalm chapter 19. It said this, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your what? Sight. O oh Lord, my rocker and my redeemer. The psalmist also said in Psalm 139, Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there is any grievous way in me and leave me in the way everlasting. John is saying that God has a searching vision, a deep vision. In Hebrews it says this in chapter 4. It talks about the word of God, but ultimately Jesus Christ is providing us the word. It says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joint and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of my heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, and all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom we must give an account so he's here, he hears this voice and he turns, he sees the golden lampstands. He sees the son of man, the ancient of days. He sees the, a prophet, a priest, a king. He sees a pure one, a holy one. He sees the eyes that are piercing. And then he sees, verse 15, his feet are like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. I don't know if you've ever been to a um, furnace, a big furnace uh, factory. Sometimes you can go into those factories and it is really hot in those factories. And then sometimes you can go in there and it just feels like the floor is just reverberating. And it's just this heat that is there and the pressure that is there. It almost feels like the whole earth is shaking. That's nothing in comparison to standing in the presence of the glorious Christ. Nothing at all. John is sitting there. He sees his feet and he's saying he sees this pure one and this pure one who wants to refine and filter us out and make us holy. He sees one that is standing before him and is thundering. And then he continues. He says in his voice, he's already told us his voice was like this huge trumpet behind him. But now he says his voice was like the roar of many waters. Have you ever been to Niagara Falls? I tell you, you know, you go onto the Maid of the Mist, I think it is one of those boats, and you know, they, they don't even get you that close to the falls, and the water's just coming across, and you're getting drenched, and the power that you're hearing, and that is nothing in comparison to the second person of the Trinity that is standing before John. He hears his voice, it's roaring, it's crashing, it's loud, it's authoritative. When he speaks, you should listen. In the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus is transfigured before the uh, disciples, and there was a voice from heaven, and it said, This is my beloved son, listen to him. So John gets this vision of Christ, and he continues this vision, and he just continues here. We see in verse 16, in his right hand, he held the stars, and from his mouth, a sharp two-edged sword. Now, I should tell you all of this. There is no literal sword that's coming out of his mouth. There is no burnished bronze on his feet. I mean, these are all pictures. And when you read Revelation, you need to read it as a picture book. That's really important. But what he's saying is this, that out of his mouth comes such authority, such power, such protection. It comes out of his mouth with such strength. And, he, and his right hand, this right hand is a place of privilege. It's a place of honor. To be on your right hand is a place of protection. And he's saying this, that in my right hand, in his right hand, he saw seven stars. Can you imagine... Back in the Roman times, they had a coin, and they would put the seven planets on their coin. And they were trying to say that they were more powerful than the planets. That was on their coin, but Christ in his hand holds seven stars. 
And these seven stars which shine out glory don't shine out any more glory than his glory. His glory is a revulgent glory. His glory is an immense glory. It doesn't compare to the stars that he holds in his hands. And then his mouth sharp two-edged sword. Some think that that could be the word of God, like the passage you just read in Hebrews, though this is probably a weapon that is used back in the Roman times. This is a devastating weapon that they would use. And his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. I, I thought of Moses going up into the mountain, and Moses says, let me see your face. And God says, you can't see my face. You see my face, you're going to die. But what I will do is I will hide you in the cleft of the rock and I will just let my backside pass by you. And when Moses came down, his face was shining so brightly that the people couldn't even look. That was a reflected glory and they couldn't even look at him because of the glory of God. John is standing before the presence of God and seeing the glory of God in presence in his life. Wow. Wow. This voice, this vision that John is seeing is overwhelming. Next, I want you to see in verse 17, the Savior's comfort and counsel. Now, uh, I'm going to tell you what John did is exactly what all of us would do. You know, some of us think we're going to high five Christ. Some of us think we're going to just go up there and give him a hug. And he, we have a relationship with him where we guess we could. But the reality is when you see God Christ in his fullness. None of us are going to be high-fiving him. None of us are going to be running to hug him. We are going to be flat on our face, face down before him. Out of fear. And that is the biblical narrative. Over and over again, when the presence of Christ or the presence of God came into somebody's mind or their lives, they dropped down faced. And that's exactly what John does here in verse 17. When I saw him, He's heard the voice, and now he's seen the vision. I saw him. I fell at his feet as though we're dead. He's like a dead man. Isaiah had this. Daniel had this. Peter had this. You will have this when you stand before this risen Christ. It's like I was dead. The fear that was dominating him. But I love this. But he laid his right hand on me, and he said, fear Go back with me to Daniel chapter 10 here for a moment. In Daniel chapter 10, he says this, a little bit longer section, so let me just read it for you. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 4 through 12, it says, On the 24th day of the first month, I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, and I lifted up my eyes and I looked, and behold, a man in linen with a belt of fine gold of upaz, around his waist. His body was like barrel, and his face was the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze. Sound familiar? And the sound of his words like the sound of the multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone, and I saw the great vision, and no strength was left in me. Basically, he was down on his face. My radiant, my radiant appearance was fearfully changed. All the blood rushed out of him. He's pale as anything. And he retain, I retained no strength, and I heard the sound of his words, and heard the sound of his words, and I fell on my face in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. And behold, the hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, Oh, Daniel, man greatly loved, Understand the words I speak to you and stand upright. For now I have sent to you, I've been sent to you. And when he had spoken these words to me, I stood up trembling. Now he's standing up trembling. And then he said, Fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your words. Daniel saw a vision of this amazing Christ. And when the, when the disciples saw the transfiguration, they saw something similar. They heard the voice, they got down on their face, and, God said, and Jesus says, fear not. 
And what Jesus says to, to John here is, fear not. And I really so appreciate this. He says, fear not, John. I am right now. And he gives John five words of comfort. And I want you to hear this before I close. I want you to hear these five words of comfort that he gives. First, he says, fear not. And he says to John that I want you to hear that I am right here with you. In my, uh, I think if you've heard me say this before, our family verse, one of our family verses is um, Isaiah chapter 41, 10. And it says this, fear not, I am with you. Do not be discouraged, I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. He says, begins by saying, fear not. It's the word of counsel to you and to me. The second, he says, I am the first and the last. He basically says, I, have the, I am before the beginning and I am before the end. There was a first of all times here. There's a last of all times and I have always existed. Fear not, number one. I am the first and the last. I am eternal. And then he says, I am the living one. It is Satan that robs us. It is Satan who goes into a school and shoots up a number of people in a school. It is Satan who wants to kill and to destroy and to murder. But Jesus Christ is the one who wants to give you life. And he wants to give you life to the full. Jesus is the life giver. And so as you know Christ and understand him, he wants to fill you with life, abundant life, transformed life. He wants to give you life. Fear not. Fear not. I want you to know, so know that I am the first and the last. I want you to know that I am the living one. And then I want you to hear the gospel. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. I died in your place. I rose victoriously for you. You stand firm in the gospel because of what I have done for you. Let that comfort you. And then he says, I have the keys of death and Hades. Keys are authoritative. You know, if you have keys, you have some level of authority or power. If you have a key to a building, you can come into that building. The key opens an entrance in and it gives access. Jesus says, I have the keys of death and Hades. I have the keys of death. I have the keys of hell. I have the keys to let you into heaven. Don't be worried about death. Some of us cling so heavily to this life, so fearful of death. We cling to the 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years that God gives us. And God says, I want you to know that the keys to life are in my hand. So take comfort. Don't fear. Take comfort. I'm the first and the last. Take comfort. I am the living one. Take comfort. I died and I'm alive forevermore. And take comfort from this. Your death has no match for eternity and kingdom that is awaiting you. So John has begun this, and he is trying to give comfort. He says, this sufferer, and I've got companions, and there's a calling. And then he talks about the supreme voice and this vision that he sees. And then he says, I want to give you comfort from the Savior and counsel from the Savior. And he ends with this sovereign command, the sovereign's command and clarification. Verses 19 and 20. Once again, he gives the command. He says, write, therefore, the things that you have seen, what you're seeing right now, the things that are happening right now, and those things that are in the future. So John is writing about the things that he's seeing in his world today, at that time, and then he's writing about what he's going to see in the future, what's going to happen in the future. And then Jesus gives, the sovereign gives a clarification. He says, here's the mystery, verse 20. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, right hand, once again, protection, security, safety, significance, privilege, honor. In my right hand, the seven golden lampstands and the seven stars. The seven stars are angels of the seven churches. Now, there is some debate as to whether they're talking about supreme, uh, so, um, supernatural angels or some think that these are the church pastors. I'm not completely sure. Every other mention of angels in the book of Revelation is about the supernatural being, so I would assume that this is the supernatural being. Um, and so it seems as though we may have a guardian angel or an angel that is here, or that the angels are representing a protection of the church. Whichever way you want to look at it, there is an angel that covers us. But if it is about Tim, Doug, and I, <laughs> this was actually really... 
I don't know, this caught me. I'm called to be an angel to the church. An angel is a messenger. I'm called to speak, and we're called to speak truth to the church. That's all we can do. We can't make you believe in Christ. We can't make you be holy ones. We can preach the word and pray that the Holy Spirit does something in your life. We're called to be messengers. And in some ways, so are you. You're called to be a messenger for the good news of the gospel. So the angels are the stars, and then the seven lamps stand to the seven churches. The seven churches are you. Yes, there were seven churches back in the Old Testament and back in this time, but there are seven churches that are you, the completeness of the body of Christ. So I guess I end with this. We're living in very difficult and uh, dark days. In the next seven letters, five of the letters that he is going to give to the church are going to be stinging rebukes about where they are. They're not living holy lives. They're living more and more like the world. We need to hear that. We need to hear the conviction, and we need to correct ourselves if we're living more like the world. There were churches that were living in spiritual apathy. We need to be very mindful, to be very careful that we don't go down the path of spiritual apathy. And how do we get a sense of hope? We need to catch a vision of the glorious Christ. And when you catch a vision of this voice and the vision, the Savior's comfort and his counsel, the sovereign command and his clarification, when you do this, you will have a God that is not too small, but a God who is immensely big. Who's your vision today? I was thinking as I close with this song, there's this singer and he sings this song, I See the Lord. I'm not going to sing it for you, but I want to read the words. I see the Lord. I see the Lord exalted high above the worship of the people of the earth. I see the Lord. I see the Lord. My eyes have seen the King, the Lamb upon the throne who reigns forever, forever roar. The train of his robe fills the temple, a cloud of heavenly worshipers surrounding the throne. We join with them now crying, holy, holy is the lamb, the lamb alone. I see the Lord. I see the Lord. Exalted high above the worship of the people of the earth. I see the Lord. I see the Lord. My eyes have seen the king. The lamb upon the throne who reigns forever, forever, forevermore. Would you pray with me? Father, we are living in dark and somewhat depressing times. Father, as we get a vision of your son, that vision should produce a level of comfort to us. That's our king. <laughs> That's our Lord. That's our savior. That's our majestic. That is our sovereign. That is our superlative. That is our supreme one. We are on the winning side. I am overwhelmed by that, Lord. Father, the gates of hell are pounding against the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it will not prevail. So help us to live with that hope, Lord, that blood-bought hope by your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize that there are some of us that are in this room that are hearing my voice that have never caught a vision of that glorious Christ. They may see a loving God, they may see a meek and mild man who walked on this earth. They think that maybe they'll be able to wink and that you'll take them into the kingdom because of that. Lord, I pray that you would give them a vision of Christ. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. I pray that they would do it this side of heaven so that they can have eternity with him and not on that side where they will spend eternity away from him. Be thou my vision. O oh Lord, in my life, we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.